conceptual people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. I hope that everybody is has had a good week. I hope that things are winding down and working out for you. I know that there has been there has been a lot going on with everybody focusing on the outcome of the election, the uncertainty and all of the fear mongering that's going on. There are a lot of people who are really uh, up in arms and becoming frenetic and unglued. I am not one of those people. Uh, I have never rested my hopes on anyone else other than myself and my direct affiliations, uh, my purpose, my personal faith in my creator, the most high, uh, and my capabilities uh, as a person uh, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually, uh, to do the things that I'm capable of doing. It has been a challenge the last couple of years for so many different things and reasons, uh, but I refuse to rest in my hopes on those who have never shown me any true love or interest in who I am and what I care about. Uh, I will leave that to the others. What I would suggest is that you gain a a strong and lucid perspicacity and understanding of how things work. It is the lack of an understanding of how things work that consistently puts blacks behind the eight ball. Uh, that would be my first suggestion. Look, I'm excited to be sitting here this morning uh, in my little office uh, to come to you with the first of a coming series, first uh, episode or segment of a coming series, Beyond the Surface. Uh, before I get into Beyond the Surface, I want to talk to you a little bit about who I am and what I do for those of you who are new to the channel uh, that didn't come from the old channel and may not really know me beyond maybe a year of watching me. You, There's so much more for those who have followed me on YouTube for 10 years or more uh, from the original channel and know about me. This is just a refresher for you. I want to introduce you to who I am. In, in, in short, you'll get to know me over this series. Also, I want to tell you that the Black Voice as a radio uh, production and presentation will be back this coming week on Monday. Um, going to be bringing back my co-host, also my best friend and mentee, uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, he's going to ride this out with me. We are probably going to do uh, live segments uh, virtually initially and then actually get back in the studio together where we can really ride the chemistry uh, that we have, which is remarkable. And we're going to talk about all the issues, the enigmatic issues and problems that the black community faces and talk about the solutions. Anybody that knows me knows that my life has been about identifying the problem for the purpose of creating solutions. I am not one that wants to ride around lecturing about racism or, or all the other systemic elements and components that work to suppress us. I'm about saying, okay, this is what's going on. This is how we fix it. If there's a problem, find the source. Deal with the source, you deal with the problem. That's life, no matter where you start it, no matter where you, did, no matter where you deal with it. Whether you're talking emotionally, whether you're talking physically, whether you're talking financially, whether you're talking politically, socially, academically, find the source, fix the source, fix the problem. All of this system, systematic, dealing with uh, symptoms, uh, focusing on symptoms has never produced uh, any type of longevity in uh, overcoming something. Uh, it's the same thing. Big Pharma makes billions each year off of treating symptoms. And they know that just treating the symptoms doesn't alleviate the problem. So the people keep coming back to have the symptoms treated. We're about treating the problem. We're about addressing the problem. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to remind you that uh, earlier this year, I released book number 22. Uh, 
book number 22, The Undoing of the African-American Mind. Uh, I'm very proud of the work. I'm very proud of what it does. Uh, what it's about. It's about the research I did into uh, cognitive bias reality syndrome. Um, and, and, and so you're going to learn a lot about collective cognitive bias reality syndrome, how we think as a group and where that came from, how it impacts us, what we need to do. Uh, before that, this is book number 19, uh, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. All of these links are going to be in the description box so that you can check out these books and get a dive into who I am and what my passions are. This book right here is special uh, for a number of reasons. When I wrote my first book, which is The Invisible Father, Reversing of the Curse of a Fatherless Generation some time ago, um, what, almost 20 years ago, um, I was told by so many people that the book wouldn't be published, but it was well written, uh, it was factual, it was powerful, but there wasn't a large enough audience who would buy it to make it marketable, so publishers didn't want to touch it, and so I was told it wouldn't be touched. I found a way to make that happen. I created my own publishing company, and so I started the process of writing my books and serving my passion and publishing my own work. This book is special because I didn't publish it. It was published through Etlock Publishing. What makes it even more special is I didn't take a project to Etlock and get them to take it. Etlock came to me and said, we've seen your work and, and, and that you've done on the miseducation of black youth, and we would love to see you write that, and we will publish it, and they did. Uh, Etlock is now on the verge of dissolving, and so it looks like I'll be buying the rights, complete rights back. Uh, the deal was sweet, sweetest publishing deal I've ever seen. Matter of fact, I've created my publishing behind the modeling of Etlock, making sure that authors come in and get what they really deserve right off the top. Um, but the beauty is that probably by this time next year, I'll own all rights outright. I own the copyright to the material, but the publishing rights belong to Etlock. But when they're dissolved, I'll actually get to buy that back. And it'll be under Odyssey Media Group and Publishing, which is my company. So I'm excited about that, but you can also uh, get the link to this book in the description box. My goal from day one, uh, when I started this journey officially, I've always loved myself. Uh, I never desired to be anybody but black. I always love my people, but if I have to mark a time where I became committed uh, to the struggle and not just individual minded, it will be 1985 when I watched uh, Dr. Francis Crest Welsing on the Phil Donahue show uh, defend her Crest theory of color confrontation. Uh, this is before the release of the ISIS papers. This was uh, her presentation that explained the conflict between whites and blacks and what, what what drove it and she was there and defending it so articulately so powerfully so eloquently and so confidently that it caught my attention and I couldn't get off of it and this is important because it was on the heels of an idea a notion in the early 80s that started in the 60s and 70s, but uh, came to peak in the early 80s before it sort of start, started to uh, dissipate some. And that was the idea of black intellectual inferiority. The inherent idea of black intellectual inferiority that blacks simply were not as smart as whites. And here is this black woman standing front and center going toe to toe with, black, with white scholars. And I said, oh, yeah. And from that day forward, I knew that I would end up in the field of psychology to what extent I had no idea. But I know uh, I knew that I wanted to do it. Um, shortly after that, I came in contact with through studying Dr. Welsing, uh, Neely Fuller, Jr., who mentored her. Uh, I learned a lot from him. But then I came in contact with two of the guys that have really serve to really shape how I think, how I conduct my research, how I handle my people. And that's Dr. Naeem Ogbar and Dr. Amos Wilson. 
Uh, they played a major role in how I constructed my Afrocentric idea of what is as it pertains to psychology. Uh, I did my research and also became very, very enamored by the work of Franz Fanon. And then we moved on up through there and I came in contact with so many more of our elders and ancestors, Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Khalid Muhammad, so many others that have really, truly personally impacted me in some way or another. And so I have built this, the Odyssey Project as a mechanism and means to do the research, thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours of research on everything from redlining, uh, generational trauma, uh, sociological ills, mass incarceration, miseducation, uh, <clears throat> and on and on. And I've written about it. I've taught about it. I've created programs to overcome it. Uh, one of the programs that's my passion that I absolutely love is Black Man Leaders, a rite of passage initiative uh, that helps young black males de uh, develop a proper idea of who they are through proper racial socialization, preparing them to be men, be productive men, not just within the sphere of the black community, but as a whole. That's work that I put in years upon years. Uh, I want to give mad love and props to Dr. Joy DeGruy and Dr. Howard Stevenson, who both uh, laid the foundation for that program. It was through their work. Everybody knows Dr. DeGruy De for her work uh, in post-traumatic slave syndrome, which also uh, helped me in my work in dealing with collective bias uh, reality uh, syndrome. Uh, which is a, a way of thinking, but it derives, again, from gen multi-generational transmission of trauma. Uh, it also opened the door for me to get into the world and study the world of epigenetics to a point and level, which I was in 2016 invited to the World Conference on Cancer and Epigenetics to discuss the influence of environment on uh, cancer. Uh, from an epigenetic perspective, even though that wasn't even why I started the research. I was dealing with trauma, but um, in doing so, I learned about the up-regulating and down-regulating of cancer genes uh, and wrote about it and was asked to speak on it. Um, and so it's been an a, 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 a unbelievable journey for me, uh, over 30 years plus of learning about my people and learning about the struggles of my people and understanding at a level that allows me to present uh, ideas and solutions um, on a number of different ways. I came up with the blueprint for black empowerment. I ran that by Dr. Claude Anderson and his wife, uh, Dr. Uh, Joanne Anderson, um, and got their approval. And I posted that on the site. If you want to go to the site, just go to the site, click on resources, and go to uh, Blueprint 1.0. And the reason I entitled it 1.0 is because I don't think I know everything. It's not. It's because I know that there's so much that can be added to it. I expect there to be a 2.0, a 1.5, a 2.0, 4.0 at some point in time. People will take over what I've brought and build on it and make it better. And and that's the goal. It's not to be right. It's to be a catalyst. It's to be a catalyst in producing something that can be taken by others and built upon. That's what Dr. Stevenson and Dr. DeGru did when they determined that the uh, most influential elements in predicting and engaging and otherwise reducing the risk of African-American adolescent male violence is understanding the respect element and component and the, and the need for proper socialization. We learned through their work that there are five primary elements that predict uh, the risk of African-American adolescent, African, uh, adolescent African, African American adolescent male violence, excuse me. Um, the first, the fourth and the fifth are what I call common. You, you, you're going to find them in almost every inner city situation. Uh, and that is uh, urban hassle. Uh, urban hassle is what the average kid goes through just living in an urban uh, environment, uh, dealing with drugs on the way to school, gang violence on the way to school, in school, 
uh, ambulances all time of the night, gunfire all time of the night, uh, uh, addicts in the hallways and alleyways. And all of this is called urban hassle. And urban hassle plays a major role in the increased risk, increased, increased risk of violence among African-American adolescent males. And then the next one is having experienced violence. Um, having experienced violence uh, in some way, in other words, having been, been a victim of violence. Uh, and then other one is witnessing violence. So three, four, and five, witnessing violence, experiencing violence, and urban hassle. The top two influences, number one, the feeling of being disrespected. If you go to uh, almost any correctional facility and find someone who committed a violent act, at the core of it, the vast majority of them is going to be in some way they felt uh, disrespected. Whether it was a reasonable uh, perception of what really happened or not, the feeling of being disrespected is the number one influence. But what we found is while that's the number one influence, the most impactful the, the one that's most capable of being impacted is number two, proper racial socialization. And that's where black men lead came from. It's understanding that doing the studies and finding out that just the presence of an idea. Black males who have been properly socialized are six times less likely to commit violence than those who are not. It, that means that they are less likely to end up in prison. Uh, and part of a cycle of recidivism, uh, recidivism that leads to um, 1.5 million black men missing in our community. And so that is just one thing that got me started on this thing is really understanding the need for solutions. And so what those who have followed me for any stretch of time know uh, I'm not a Mr. Know-it-all. I, I don't talk about things I don't know. Uh, but I'm not a Mr. Know-it-all. And what I mean by that is I'm open to suggestions. As long as they're presented respectfully, as long as the real true desire in presenting them is not to uh, upstage somebody or uh, clown somebody, but to actually bring uh, something to the table to contribute, to add, to provide clarity and lucidity, uh, bring it. I learned so much from those who are a part of this community uh, at, at, at the Black Voice. I learned so much. I take from what you guys share with me. I take the little nuggets in when we do the lives and, and we're doing those uh, comments in the lives, uh, what I think they call a super chat. When, they're, when we're doing those during the live sessions, I'm taking notice of that and I'm doing the research and I'm adding that into the process of how I'm viewing things and seeing things. Every last element and component of our engagement is a part of our psychology, and we have to understand that. And so I move with that. But what I want to really actually do from this point forth, like on Thursdays, you're going to get a, a, a 20 to 30 minute segment every Thursday uh, from a series called Beyond the Surface. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take things that we talk about a lot, but we normally only look at the surface and we never truly delve deeply into it to find out the movements and the mechanisms uh, and elements and components that are all at play that create the reality. We tend to act off of emotion. We tend to act off of what we see in the narrative without ever truly being aware of how things are actually put together and working. Because when you understand how something works, you can now understand what needs to change in order to change the result. What we're about is changing outcomes. That's what we're about. We're about changing outcomes. We're about taking what we see in front of us and determining what it is we don't want, what it is we don't like, what it is that does not serve us, and coming up with viable solutions of how to create a better situation. It's not about complaining. It's not about finger pointing. It's not about any of those things. It's about saying we have the power within ourselves to create the reality in our world that we desire, but we must focus on us. Uh, one of the most powerful African proverbs that I've ever come across is, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. And that's what we have to really truly understand. There's always gonna be an enemy. 
on the outside. There's always going to be an enemy. Uh, we can talk about racism till we're blue in the face. We can talk about this racial caste system. We can talk about mass incarceration. We can talk about Jim Crow segregation. We can talk about urban renewal, benign neglect, redlining. We can talk about miseducation of our youth. We can talk about all of these things that are taking place, the killing of black men and women in the street by police officers, the sanctioned killing of our people. We can talk about all of this, but if we don't come up with a solution of how we are going to protect ourselves, how we are going to value lives at a level that requires action. See, until we put action into our expressions, our emotional expressions are, are accompanied by true action that are representative of what we truly feel and what we truly profess, we will never be taken seriously. You can scream all day long that black lives matter. You can scream all day long that we matter. You can scream all day long that we are tired of being killed. Until you start to take actions that show the value you place in yourself, in your life, in your loved ones, in your children, in your mates, until they can see black love being personified in the everyday interactions with one another, until they can see that taking a black life comes with a consequence, until they can see that we are willing to educate our own children at a level that not only prepares them to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and compete, but to go out into that world and win. We have that capacity to do that, but we can never sit up and expect someone else to do it for us. It, it makes absolutely no sense for another group to sit up and empower our kids to compete with their kids, and yet we ask them to do it every day. We've got to get our minds focused on the true nature of what's happening here. If we want our children to be able to compete with other children, we have to prepare them. The people whose children are competing against ours will never prepare ours to win against theirs. That has to be understood. We have to be able to look and see beyond the surface. So from this day forward, uh, on Thursdays, we're going to do this. We're going to bring back the Black Voice on Mondays. Black Voice is going to be live. I think I'm going to do it at 11 a.m. Central uh, standard time, but it's going to be actually streamed live. This one is going to probably most of the time be pre-recorded uh, because I may have to move a little bit here and there in the time that it's recorded. But it will be up and posted by 12 noon every Thursday. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to start to talk about things on a level that goes deeper than what we see and what we feel. We've got to actually be beyond that. We've got to go deeper. We've got to understand things from a more uh, complex level. And it's going to take work. It's going to take time. So I'm going to take things we deal with on a regular basis and I'm going to break them down. I'm going to bring them to you. We're going to look at them at multiple levels. I'm going to ask you to put in the work. Go do things. We have to be willing to do what's necessary in order to have what we say we want. No one else is going to give it to us. We need to get off of the idea that someone's going to came, come along and be a savior to our people. We are designed and built to save ourselves. On that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Don't forget to get the books. Uh, there are more books. Like I said, I have 22. But these are the ones that I'm really proud of that I want you guys to focus on. Uh, the, the Undoing of the African American Mind, Born in Captivity, Number 19, that was number 22, number 19. Number 16, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America. Uh, the links are going to be in the uh, description box. Also, in the description box, in the first paragraph, is a way that you can show your support for the work that we do at the Odyssey Project. Um, and it's so much that's going on. We're still trying to raise the funds to do the 15 City Tour, where we are going to help people build uh, these rites of passage programs and implement them in their own community. Uh, that's for Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters as well as Black Men Lead um, and a couple of other initiatives. We're also going to be working to create a national network where these cities are connected and working as a unit and network together to create the cohesiveness that's going to be necessary to unify. We can talk about unity all day, but if we don't create and put the mechanisms in place to actually bring it, bring it about what we want, we need your support. Go there. You can either click on the link and go to the site and give, or you can uh, give directly through the organization's cap app, cash app account. 
However you do so, it will be greatly appreciated. On that note, I am checking out of here. You guys have an unbelievable week, and we'll be seeing you every week here, and we'll be seeing you definitely on Mondays for whatever the hot topic is for the black voice on that day. Uh, for, on that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day. Peace. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement. For those who have followed me for any stretch of time, you know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all the love and support that you have given uh, and sent my way and my wife's way and the organization's way. Now, I want to just take a brief moment to remind you that we still need your support. We still need your help. Go to the description box of one of our videos and see how you can support the work we're doing. Keep supporting, keep loving us, and we're going to keep loving you back. Have an awesome day. Talk Real about talk, I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements.